Okay, beautiful. Now we're ready to go. So welcome to session 12 of CE 120C, 220C. This is a class all about uh, parametric optimization. So what we do in this class is we spend a lot of time building uh, 3D models of structures and buildings and then thinking about how we can change features of those buildings parametrically so that we can rapidly kind of evaluate what the impact of those changes would be. So right now we're right in the middle of looking at some things all about solar analysis and the sun and how the sun affects the surface. Um, thinking about really how much sun energy is hitting the surface of different buildings and if we start changing the parameters of that surface, just change its shape, change the way it waves, we're going to experiment with some sine wave stuff today, um, how the amount of energy you collect through solar energy changes. Okay, and, and you could actually use that to try and figure out an optimal shape, something that would either try to capture as much sun as possible or not, depending upon what you want to do. Okay, so that's what we're up to in this one. Um, as a recap for people who were here last time, um, we left off with what we spent some time last time optimizing some window overhangs, so thinking about an existing building and some shades that could be at the side of a window, how we could determine the size of the shades based upon where the sun is in the sky, and thinking about how that changes at different times of the year. Then we went off and started to use a new tool, a solar analysis tool, which gives us a lot of detailed information about how the sun hits surfaces. And the reason it was important to start using a tool that gave us a little more information than what we had done in the prior example was early on we started looking at just the vector to the sun in the sky and thinking about how that is oriented relative to the surface and doing a cross product to sort of figure out if it's very direct or very indirect. Is it a, a good angle or is it a perpendicular angle? Um, what we needed to do though was move to sort of doing something that would consider all the different angles because since the sun moves around throughout the day and throughout the year, only evaluating a single angle is not really a very fair evaluation. So it's better to kind of think about across the span of 365 days at all different times of the day. So that's where we've been. What people are working on in class is assignment two, which is all about trying to vary a parametric structure to see if we can come up with some parameters that'll help you soak up as much sun as possible. Okay, so they're designing some individual things relative to uh, like some parametric structures they have been working on. Creating some new ones. There's actually some interesting ones, and I might call on Andy to kind of share here them a little bit here. Um, but I've been meeting with a lot of people in office hours, and for the most part, people seem to be like plugging away, doing okay in terms of what's going on. The first part of the assignment was all about just taking your existing structure and varying it a little bit and trying to evaluate the surfaces. And you know, today, what we're going to go into is really how we can start um, really using list mapping to do a little bit better in terms of trying to evaluate many different things. So where we're going to go today is to use something called list mapping, which is a really powerful function, which allows us to go through and really apply a type of evaluation not only to a single item, but to a whole bunch of items. Okay, so we're going to start out by looking at kind of a single parametric surface and how you can vary it, something like you may be doing in your assignments. But then we're going to think about how we can actually apply this solar tool, which is typically done to an entire surface, to really evaluate a whole series of surfaces individually. And list mapping is something that lets you go through and evaluate individual things. What you do is create a custom node, and then you basically plug different values that you want to test into that node. We're going to look at it in terms of returning a single value or many values, and even writing those values out to an Excel file. And then finally, we're going to look at how we can basically use list mapping to vary input parameters to change things quickly and kind of test and see what the results are. So let me go ahead and get ourselves started. We're going to start with 12.1, so if you can, go ahead and open that up. That's just a kind of parametric surface. Let's take a look at it and what the solar analysis tool can return. And within that, I want to talk a little about custom nodes and how we can use those. So I'm going to go over to uh, the Revit environment. So we do a lot of our work in a, a PC-based uh, modeling tool for architecture called Revit. Let me see if it's open right now. It is open right now. Let me go ahead and close all my stuff that's hanging around in the background. And I will just go ahead and open up oh, in 12.1. We'll start with this panelized surface. Well, actually, it's got a funny name for it because it's not really, it's still a single surface here. 
But to get ourselves going, oh, that's not good. We never like unrecoverable errors. Yeah, that's a little bit of uh, the software crashing, which it'll do. I'll try that again. Miss Claire, do you have a question? Nope. Okay. <laughs> You're stretching. Yes. Okay. So I will go through and open up kind of really a relatively blank file. We're going to go through and create some new things in here. It, it looks, does this look familiar? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and just delete this uh, initial thing that's kind of hanging around here because we're going to regenerate it. That's an example of a surface, but that already has some panels on it. So we're going to start with a fresh blank slate. And what I'm going to do is open up the Dynamo environment so we can generate a surface mathematically. But it is indeed influenced by uh, some of your good thinking. <laughs> So let's go ahead and I'm going to start out with 1A. Oops, I think I'm looking at the wrong example there. Yeah. Yeah, it's not looking right. Open. Let's go right to the right example. So what we're going to do is look at a surface that is made up of a couple different sine curves. So the way the surface is actually made is there's three different sine curves, uh, curve one, curve two, and curve three, and they're each parametrically determined. So we can sort of rapidly go through and change them, kind of change the degree of waviness so that we can kind of quickly evaluate just what the effect of different waves might be on our ability to capture sun. So I'm going to rotate that around just a hair. So we're going to look at it a little more end on. Okay. Where all the action is going in terms of being able to change the surface is happening up here in what I'll call the upper left-hand corner of the programming. This is this uh, Dynamo programming environment that uh, it's really a visual programming environment where we have different nodes that are connected together and we can sort of change different input values and just kind of track them on through. What I have set up here is basically just a surface. I have the overall length of the surface that we can vary. So that's kind of a nice parametric thing to be able to change. So if I want that to be very long or very narrow, I can go through and kind of flex it that way. I can also go through and really look at there's three different curves. And for each of those different curves, I have a y offset that shows how far away it is from the axis. Okay. I have a number of waves, and I also have a wave amplitude. So based on those, I can go through and either flatten out or kind of make very large each of those different curves. For example, if I go through and say, give it a wave amplitude of zero, then I'm just going to flatten that out. separation between the curves. But in the same sense, if we wanted to go through and change that, make it a much wider structure, I can go ahead and, well, it looks like I don't have much range in there. Make it a little bit wider. Okay, so I can go through and sort of change the curviness. If I wanted to go ahead and have a big wave on the front of the curve, I can do that, a smaller wave there. I can also change the heights. The base heights are just the heights of the edges. So right now it dips down a little bit in the center. But if I wanted to go through and pull it down and have it go very low in the center, I could change that value. Okay. Or if I wanted to have it be more even, I could go through and change that too. So, this is just an example of a good parametric surface, and I will admit, it sort of uh, is driven by a lot of thinking we come up together, you know, in terms of thinking about waves and number of waves we can put in there. A really kind of cool thing about this is the whole notion of the number of waves in there. Like right now, this has a very even number of waves on both sides. It's four, really, in all those. But if I wanted to have something even a little stranger and harder to evaluate, 
I could change the number of waves. So it's four on one side, eight on the other side, and that's a really kind of interesting, a little hard to understand surface. Okay, but even though it's a very hard to understand surface, we still can go through and evaluate it pretty quickly. So to create these curves, just, oh, because the whole notion of taking that sine wave and kind of plotting points and creating that line was something I started doing an awful lot and I wanted to do it a couple different times, I actually created a custom node to do that. So what I did was created a node that had kind of these uh, different input values, what the y value was, what the base would be, the number of waves and the amplitude. And this code will actually look a little bit familiar to a lot of you. If I go through and open up this custom node, <coughs> you'll see that what this does is based on, oh, a surface length and a number of waves, it goes through and computes just basically some z values. There's a number of waves, and I multiply that by 360, because I want to have, based on the number of waves, that many degrees considered. I'll take the sine value of that, multiply it by the amplitude, and add, add the base height. But that gives me an effect of a sine wave. It goes through and creates that. And the reason I went through and put it in this function was that I could use the same function to create three different sine waves very easily. So it's kind of a nice programming construct to just go through and make these custom modules. So by doing that, I didn't have to repeat that code. I could just go ahead and have the different input values, the length, the number of waves, the height of the wave, and based on that, generate some points and create a curve out of those. So custom nodes are going to be your friend today. You're going to learn to like custom nodes because they make it very easy to not only kind of, uh, what, keep your graphs kind of nice and clean in terms of being able to encapsulate a lot of different programming that's going on. But they're also really good in that if I make a change to that node, it'll start changing everything. So, you know, any change you make can go ahead and be percolated to a lot of different surfaces very quickly. So, this is my surface. And relative to what you guys are working on, you may have other surfaces that flex dynamically too. But this is like an example of what I call the pretty cool dynamic surface. Okay, what I did was I just went through and took different curves, I put them together into a list, and then I made a lofted surface out of that. That just goes ahead and you know, combines them together and makes a solid surface between the two. So actually, before I do solar analysis, Andrew, do you have yours handy? I put it on A360. Okay, let me go ahead and see if we can grab that. Because just another good example, let me go on out there of an interesting surface was one that Andrew was working on. Let's go out and take a look here. Okay, we'll go to our class website. Uh, where to go? Out there, parametric design. And in Andrew, there's the bus stop. Okay, work in progress? Yep. That one. Great. Okay. Can I download the whole folder? It's going to compress them. Download will automatically begin soon. Okay, that's looking a little bit better. Let's see what it actually did. So if I go out there. Okay, so open up the Revit file and then a nearby Dynamo file. Okay, let's do that. So if we want to explore Andrew's work, what we're going to do is go back over to Revit. And what I'll do is I'll close up my work for right now. Open up his file instead. Where do I go? It's out there on my downloads. much messing around with file systems. Okay, go to downloads. Here's Andrew. There's your Revit project. <laughs> that got an ooh out of the crowd. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. This is certainly an interesting looking surface and let me go ahead and open up your Dynamo script and you can tell us about it. Call 
called it a squid. But you know, what do I know? Downloads over here, not there. Oh, come on, you don't mess with me. Oh, it's, it's there. Oh, what's there? In the folder. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. I'm looking right past it. Okay, so please come join us up here. Tell us about it. Give, give this part a test drive. <laughs> okay, because I think just uh, how people go through and create interesting parametric objects is actually. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of this. Okay, so. In the driver's seat today. Imagine that. I didn't bring my mouse though, so I apologize right. for that. Oh, oh, oh no. Bird zooming. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, zooming with trap pad is a weird thing. Yeah. Let's see, control, click. Let's see, which one lets me drag around? Uh, so usually I just go up and grab the little arrow okay. guy. Yeah. Gotcha. It's kind of slow and tedious, but it works. Okay. Uh, I'll, I think I'll live. Make, make him suffer. <laughs> it's better this way. Okay, uh, so left side, um, I set up control. So the basic idea of this one is that. Actually, did it generate already? Below. Just, just dra drag that down and it'll run it once. Okay. Got it. Might take a second to run since I think whenever you first open the dynamo file, it takes a while to no, create up points again. Give us the overall uh, idea. The overall idea is that um, it's a circular structure. You have some kind of wavy amplitude going around it, so instead of having a linear sine wave, it's a circular sine wave. There's a nice um, place point by cylindri cylindrical coordinates, which helps you just run that easily. Um, and then you get to adjust the relative height of the building, north and south, you get to adjust the amplitude, and you get to adjust the, um, the damping feature. So you can make either the north side or the south side less wavy than the uh, other side of it. So by that, do you make so yeah, so you have an amplitude, and then there's a damping factor attached to that, which will multiply between zero and one. Across so, the sine wave. Across the sine wave, so it'll be more squished on one end and less squished on the other end. So right now, um, I have full damping on the north side, so you get that curve shape, uh, just like a flat curve in the back. And then on the front side, there's no damping, or little damping, so you still have the wavy part. Um, if I change one of these, so this is the damping on the north side. If I change that all the way down to zero and change the south side, maybe up to 0.5 or so. Whoops. Uh, undo. <laughs> there we go. And then run. This one should go a lot faster. Um, maybe. I empathize with Andrew. It's, if anything happens when you're standing up there, immediately your brain blanks out and your hands do weird things that they're not supposed to do. I just blame the maths, actually. Kind of an interesting structure in that so you're using circular coordinates to basically do the wave relative mm -hmm. to a circle. Right. I tried like doing something, something else where you took a polygon and divided into n sides and made a sine wave that was linear on them and rotated them into place. Um, that's a lot messier than just making a circle straight up. Okay. Uh, so this one will take a while to run. If I hide it to the side, you can see um, there's also the entire solar analysis. Um, just from the demo class. It's easy enough to copy things from the example files into the working files by saving it to a custom node, or opening a custom node, copying that text over in another Dynamo instance, saving that, importing the node, and then copying it, pasting it again. So if that simple. sounds weird, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. <laughs> and then it has the standard color by solar radiance. So the south side was the one that was more wavy, the north side is the one that's um, less wavy. So as expected, the south side gets a lot more sunlight, so you have brighter yellows. And then in the sort of dips or troughs of the waves, you have shading because you have all the sides around it, so it's a lot less light there. So essentially, yeah, eventually I want to make it so that it sort of optimizes both the tilt north-south of the building and the um, amplitude waviness so that you either you do something about maximizing or minimizing solar gain throughout the year. Possibly do it by months. We'll see. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. So interesting things to explore, and I think Claire and I are talking about exploring this too, is this whole notion of if you put all those little folds in there, it's kind of interesting. Can you ever create something that's folded in such a way that the folds pick up more energy than just having a flat surface? Because each of the folds has sort of a good side and a bad side, kind of a sunny side and a shady side, and it's kind of to be proven whether or not you can. And I suspect you can, but it may take a little bit of messing around to uh, kind of find that. But that's what we're going to play yeah. around with today, to see if we can come up with optimums. So super. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. That's a great example. Long too. Did you just incorporate the new fade factor into your sign for code block? It's a code block. Okay. There's no function for that? You didn't find a function for that? <laughs> I don't know, at some point it's just easier to write the functions <laughs> manually. At which point you're going to write it and publish it. Like I'll even use <laughs> math.sign instead of using a sign node. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank, thank you for sharing. I, I always appreciate willing or semi-arm twisted victims <laughs> who are willing to uh, like play along. So uh, that's very helpful. Okay, let me go back over to our funny little example. And I'll go back over to the Dynamo again. Where's Dino? It's hanging around in the background still, I think. Let me open up, and we're going to do something likewise. We're going to build up to that. And how we're going to do that is, well, I can't have battery running low. That's not good. Come back in here. We're going to open up uh, the 1A again and just hook together a few very simple things to get us going. What are you doing? Open. I think there's a file open dialog hanging around somewhere and I can't tell. Let's see. Okay, back over to You thought my surface looked a little strange in my uh, card. This is actually a uh, similar sort of thing to it on. I'm varying it in the Z direction, and there's varying it in a cylindrical direction. It's the same sort of thing going on. The same idea is can we go through and talk about those like uh, waves and like uh, think about how you know they might factor into all this. Okay. So, oh, what am I looking at here? What I want to do is actually go through and take that surface and do some solar analysis on it. And last time we looked at a node, one of the nodes that came from the Dynamo team that actually was for creating doing solar analysis, and it looked something like this. I copied a little bit of it into my script here. Basically, it looks like this. We are going to go ahead and feed it it's so a weather file. We're going to tell it about where we're located on the Earth, and it'll grab the weather. We're going to feed it some analysis surfaces. We can feed it some shading surfaces, things that would actually shade the surface and block it. And we feed it a range of time values that we want to go through and consider, whether it's all year round or only the summer or only specific times of the day. Okay. We also have uh, this whole notion of what the grid spacing is. Um, if we set that to be very fine, then we get a lot of data points, but it will take longer and be more accurate. If we set it for coarse, it would give you a quick answer, but it would be a little bit less accurate. So this node was really the core of what we're after. And then out of this node, based on the results, we're going to go through and figure out a whole range of values for the solar radiations that hit that surface. And then we put some color coding on here just to go through and see what it looks like. Now, where does this code came from, or a quickie way of grabbing code and getting it in is to do something like this. And Andrew sort of alluded to it, just so you all sort of know how it works. If this block of code is something that you would like to use in your kind of uh, project too, what you can do is this. If you say, go through and create a new custom node, okay? And this is going to be something very simple like just temp storage because all I'm really using it is as like a clipboard. 
The problem is, when I try to copy and paste code between different Dynamo graphs, I can't do it. It will only keep a single graph open at a time. But it will keep a uh, custom node open at the same time. So if you want to copy things back and forth, you can use a custom node. It sounds weird as a clipboard. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of create this custom node. This is a temporary holding spot. Come back over to the main node. Just go ahead and grab that. Say copy it to the clipboard. And just paste it over here. And why am I doing this? It's just so I can go ahead and have code go between two different. Uh... There it is. It's just off the screen. Okay, so super. I have that. Now I can copy that and go through and put it into another node. Although, we're going to find out in just a little bit. It's not bad to have this as a custom node because you can think about this as being a custom node where we're feeding it weather, we're feeding it analysis surfaces, we're feeding it a range of time, and then it will do all this work for us. So it's not a bad custom node to have around. Okay, but the reason again for doing this is if I save that away, I go ahead and again what I'll usually do is go through and put it in the same folder where I have my other examples. If you leave it um, up at the highest level where it's just sort of embedded in the default directory, the problem is it may not be there on machine to machine. So I'll just gonna save this away as part of this example. Oh, if you wanted to try really quickly, just kind of spinning that around, um, it's azimuth around. So as opposed to being east to west, you know, kind of, kind of shimmy it around to north south. Okay, and that would actually be a perfectly reasonable thing to think about is yeah. input value of change. You can say, it's like a list value. exactly. Yeah. See, you're, you're thinking ahead. <laughs> okay, so let's go back over here. And just hook this up and kind of uh, get some initial feedback on this entire surface. For this entire surface, what it's looking for is it wants a surface right here and it wants surface over here in order to do the colorization. Other things are already hooked up right now. You'll see that I have it hooked up to the weather. It's using the weather just from the Revit file right now. So I put this one at Stanford, California. It's going to grab the location. For the time, I'm just doing it between June and funny looking time period right there. Let me change this to be, oh, let's say uh, September 21st. 2015 at 11 p.m. In case I got a time zone, we are ready. What we need to do now is basically just hook the uh, different parts together. So what I'm going to do is actually grab the surface, the surface that I created up here, and plug it in both as the surface to analyze and also the surface to apply the color to. So to do that, what I'm going to do is just grab from this node, and I'm going to do it. It's kind of at a small scale. It's hard to see, but I sort of know where the targets are. That's the analysis. It's going to go through and do that analysis in the background. That's why it's spinning around. It says the run has started over here. Doing its thing. The other one I'm going to put up to, though, is the display values over there. And to get the display values, I'm going to again grab the surface and pop it over there. See what I got here. Should be looking good. I'm not seeing colors though, so let's see if I can figure out why. I got a surface. I'm coming over here. I don't see things like the values that I want to see in there. I sometimes wonder it should be, I think the surface should be there, blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure why that's not regenerating. Let me try this. Sometimes it's a little strange in terms of getting things to regenerate, so it actually helps to
do what I'll call goose it along a little bit. Although, actually, let's see what the values are. I should not presume there. Let's just come over here and sort of see what the values are. It does look like there's some valid values, so that part looks pretty good. If I come down to this part which scales the values, that looks like those are looking valid. If I come over here, it looks like it has indeed mapped to some colors. So the question is, why are those colors not mapping to the surface? Yeah. 11 p.m. at the site. That could be something. It should be doing everything continuous, but that'd be funny if it was actually doing it at the end. That's a good idea, though. Let's try it. So let's go back to like 5 p.m. If I try to get sort of the cumulative, it should do something, although this is an example of what I'll call goosing the system. What happens sometimes is when it's going through and running, uh, we need to go through and change things because it tends to, if it doesn't think anything has changed upstream, it won't recompute downstream. Again, I'm not seeing my colors. which is kind of bothering me. How about for you guys? Are you guys seeing colors? So let's try one other thing here in terms of these colors. Guys, certainly look like I have a bunch of colors here. Let's try, oh, I'm going to try a little list flattening. Sometimes when I don't see things and they're not showing up the right way, it's an issue of just sort of things being at the wrong uh, like hierarchy. Well, this has not worked for a little while. We'll see. Let me try this. I'm going to try uh, list flatten. Okay. What list flattening is all about is taking a list that has hierarchy and just going through and trying to remove a layer of hierarchy from it. So I could take these colors. Let me try flattening at one level to see if that has anything to do with this. Doesn't look like that's doing it. Ah, no, wait, I got a little, okay, I got the display surface, that's there. Let me try flattening it too. Something is definitely odd, because this was working a little while ago. Let me try this. Open up 2B, or 1B, try that instead. So save your changes, no. And let's see if it's showing up in there. In 1B, I had it all hooked up and theoretically working right. We'll see what the difference is. I don't think I need any of the slapping stuff. Let's just go ahead and see. So I got that same surface. That's OK. I got basically the surface coming on down during the solar radiation. That should be fine. I got the display colors over there. That should be fine. I'm going to count myself as a little mystified about why that doesn't show up right there. It is showing up here. So something about the code, I wonder if that's something to do with the way I have the time set up. There's definitely something about it that wasn't quite right. But let's go ahead and try flexing this and see if um, we can make any difference. The way this is set up right now, it's going to run automatically. So theoretically, if I go through and change any of these values, this thing should change automatically, and the sun surface should change automatically, too. So let's just go through and take a look at that. I'll zoom on in here. Any preferences? OK, you sort of get a sense of where the hot side is and the cold side in terms of what's going on here. What would you like to see us do to this uh, surface? I can change the waves, change the heights. What would you like to see? I like to sort of raise it all up on that side and lower it on that side. Yeah. Let's try something like that. Okay, that would be taking edge three and raising its base height up. So let's go through and try that. So over here on this, let's go ahead and just, um, edge three is down here, the base height. The idea of maybe kind of pushing it up towards the sun more. Actually, when I've got the automatic computation turned on, it's typically better to go through and either turn it off or just type in values. OK, 
Okay, so that seems to be helping at the upper end in terms of getting a little more positive and a little less negative in there. Other things we could try doing, oh, we could, for example, just flatten out that. That would be basically changing the wave amplitude. So if I change that wave amplitude to more like one, those will be a little smaller. It's like corrugated roof, actually. Now, here's the interesting question, though. It's this whole issue, although I flattened it out there, I've actually created less surface area. So I have good surface area, but less of it. So the question is, am I getting ahead or not? And it's a little hard to tell right now in terms of what's going on. Um, I could go through and keep on playing with a lot of other things about this. I could, for example, oh, change the number of waves. The number of waves gives you Guy, that number of waves over on the three curve. That'll just give you a finer pattern. So let's not go over there and close to four waves. We'll do that. Oops. That number of waves there. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. Oh, no, it's still confusing. It's like it's trying to be exactly, or it broke. <laughs> 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 Certainly not. Uh, he, he has little faith. <laughs> oh my God, what's going on here? In this case, though, the foot, so interesting how flat that has become. Oh, it's become over here. I put a zero. Check this out. It stuck that before I actually got a chance to uh, kind of put it back there. And again, we have another surface. Okay, so we got all this kind of color information. The question is, at a high level, you know, how are we doing though? And that's really kind of what we want to get to is to really have an overall evaluation of the surface. And here's what I need to do to do something like that. I'm going through, and you can see down here in the part where I do the analysis, I'm getting all sorts of solar insulation values. The cumulative values are that's the total amount of insulation across the entire summer period. So that's actually not bad. If you're thinking about putting solar panels on your roof, that'd be a good one to check, because you'd sort of see how much you collect in the summer. Okay. Uh, if I wanted to say there's all these different solar insulation values that have been computed at all these individual points, and I want to say how much solar insulation can I collect on the entire roof, all you do is add them all up. Okay. So what I can do is out of this cumulative right here, let's just go ahead and I'll do something called list flattening just to go ahead and make it a single list. Right now it's got a little bit of hierarchy because it's like an XY grid. So I'll flatten the list out, and then I'll do a sum. So we'll say list uh, flatten, and I'll go through and pull those values down. In terms of how much to flatten, in this case, I think I'm going to actually flatten two levels because I need to get it out and out a second level. So I'll say two levels in here. That should give us just a long flat list of all the different values. And now I can say it's math sum. <laughs> and now there's the total value. Now some people have questioned and wondered, what is the naming scheme on all this? And I wish it were 100% uh, consistent, but it's not. In general, what it is is you sort of think of the noun, and that's the verb that usually follows it. Math is actually just a core function, so that can be used on anything, so it's not just for this. That's why it sort of shows up there. But in general, it's kind of the noun, or in this case, the name of the package, and then same verb. So when I say list create or list.math, I sort of know it's in that neighborhood. But I usually do. You'll find out. I'm always over here searching for things. I never quite remember what things are. Okay, so this is our total evaluation here. It's 500, and who can actually put all those zeros in there? It's like 501 million. Okay, so if this is 511 million, okay, and we tried something, oh, that instead had very big waves on it. Okay, so for example, as opposed to having the wave amplitude of one up there, what if I had a wave amplitude of like five again? 
So again, big waves on the top. And I'm sort of curious, is it get better or worse? Any speculation? Are you a betting person? Better. I mean, I don't know. I've guessed it. So <laughs> this is a, this is a fair bet. Oh, you look so pained back there. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Oh, looks like he's in the 400s. Okay, so in this case, we haven't gained enough of advantage, at least in the summertime. So, yeah, those deep furrows aren't quite good enough in terms of that. Maybe uh, we're going to keep on playing with the geometry. Okay. But it's sort of the sphere of the whole analysis is going through and uh, being able to do something like this and coming up with a single evaluation. So let's pause there for a second. Does this whole idea of taking a single surface, being able to grab all those values and come up with an evaluation of that surface, because that sort of makes sense. Yeah. I'm really confused as to what the amount of the sum actually does. Oh, okay. The list. Yes, it sums up that list. So just for that whole list, it just gives you the total of all those values. So I don't know how many are in there, but it all adds up to that. And what's the list showing? The list is showing these are all the insulation values at the different points on that surface based on a two by two grid. Okay. okay. Do we know the units? Um, you can look it up. It's in here, yeah, it's, it's oh, I, I don't know the hand, but at betting it's kilowatt hours per meter square for something or other. Another function, though, that you might want to use, if you're not a math sum type of person, you could say just give me the average. The average would somehow be very similar. We take all those numbers, compute an average of those numbers, which is now 415. That's sort of between the highs and the lows. We can kind of check out that. It's sort of a little bit different. And as you're thinking about the analysis, you can think about an average rating for this, or the sum is actually tr the true total insulation. It's really kind of whichever way you want to approach it. Okay, they're both kind of perfectly valid. Another way that people sometimes work with this, though, is they'll go for the peak. Like, what is the absolute best value anywhere on there? And you can say list max item. And that's always good for finding peaks. Now, you might happen to notice that this whole notion of summing, averaging, and choosing the peak is actually built into the node, too. And that's all they're using, really, in the background. As they're going through and computing all these data points at every hour, at two by two grids throughout the entire summer, the data they're recording is just either the sum, the average or the peak, and they're just getting you those values across the entire grid. Here we're doing it across the entire surface, you know, kind of uh, as a single number. So it's the same sort of idea, same sort of math going on here. It's very similar to math going on back in National Geographic. Are the averages that are coming out of the function across each like, panel section? Actually, it's every data point. So watch this. If you come on over here, there's a grid right now of. Oh, it's, it's averaging over the time period. Yes. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yes. Because if we go across the three months and we say it's every hour, you're going to get you know, 90 days times however many hours, like 24 hours. So you get a lot of points in there. Okay. So this is how we get started. We can go ahead and just do something like this. But so far, we haven't done any of our list mapping. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Um, as we think about using our list mapping, well, let me go ahead and kind of keep on going with this example. I'm going to flip my order a little bit from what I was planning to do today. So I think it's actually a good example here. Um, there's this whole notion of checking many different values and trying to vary things. For example, you know, Chloe was sort of suggesting what would happen if we changed the project rotation. Okay, as a value, you know, we could also go through and change any of the values that are up here. 
any of those are fair game too. But the idea of a list map is this. As opposed to us manually going through and putting in a number, checking it, putting in a number, checking it, putting in a number, checking it, we'll just go ahead and set it up with a whole list of values to check and get all those numbers back out the tail end just as a single operation. Okay, so let's see if we can do this. We're, we're going off script now, but it was a little work. If, for example, we were going to go ahead and think about changing that rotation, that might be kind of an interesting thing to see how if the project of surface is rotated around, that might change. And let's show you what that would look like. The idea with a list map is this. It's actually pretty straightforward. You're just going to go through and take some sort of function and based, or you're going to create a function where there's a single input value, everything else is the same, and feed it a list of values to go through and change. So in a weird way, you could take and say that this whole kind of graph, everything going on here, really is like one giant function really think about all this stuff as being a function where all we want to do is go through and change that input value for the rotation. Okay, and if you want to do that, here's how we can do it. So let me stop with it just a second. You sort of understand what I'm going to try to do here. I'm going to try and say, given the same set of parameters everywhere else, if I just go through and change the rotation value, you know, how does the value change? Okay, make sense? Maybe. What I'm going to do is I need to create a custom node that has all of the different functions, all the different pieces in it that I want to use, okay, with one opening, one thing that can be changed. And how I'm going to do that is we're going to go ahead and just grab, oh, I'm just going to grab this part right here. And I'm also going to grab this part up here. I'm going to say, let's create a custom node with those things. So how you do that is if we've chosen those two sections and we want to kind of create a custom node of those, actually, in terms of those, let me grab this guy too because I do want to create the surface. So let me grab it too. I'll grab this, I'll grab that, I'll grab the other. I got all three of those. I'm going to say, let's go ahead and create a node from the selection. And what happens when I say create the custom node? Okay, let's just, uh, what is this going to be? It's going to be surface test uh, rotation parameter. Say okay. It created a single node. I'm still creating a node right now. Actually, I see it up there. Let it finish doing its thing. It's copying everything up there. It's the one that's hanging right here right now. So when it gets done going through and saving itself, let's go back and take a look. I'm going to say, let's take a look at that node. You'll see that node currently has a couple of different things that are feeding into it. It has the weather, it has the idea of the time frame, it has the length of the surface, after that it's going to generate the surface and give us some cumulative values. So that part's all the same. Everything is just sort of encoded into that. So what I can do is let me go and edit this node. You'll see it looks amazingly familiar because it really is just all those um, nodes that we were uh, having in the main graph prior. So I have them all kind of hanging around in here. So inside here, nothing's changed. Okay, and let's just kind of work on its functionality a little bit. As we try to sort of uh, work with this and think about different input parameters, Things that it's inputting are the weather, it's implementing, implementing the time, the length of the surface. Those are all things that kind of came from the prior analysis. I'll just pull those down a little bit. The one thing that I was actually thinking about changing in here that would actually be sort of interesting is the rotation though. So what I need to do is actually go through and create an input for rotation. 
and then I can feed it into this node. So here's how I would do that. I'd come through and say, let's go ahead and, oh, the function's actually right over here. As opposed to having this project rotation being set to zero, okay, I'm going to create an input for what the rotation is. And to do that, all I have to do is type in input. Okay, this creates a new input variable. I can link that into project rotation. And then I'll give it a name. I'm going to call it, oh, what is this? I'll just call it project rotation. Okay, and here's what's going to happen is if I go through and put that input here in the custom node, it will show up as one of the inputs that's available to this node. Okay. On the output side of this node, oh, we can get all sorts of different things outputting. It looks like the surface is coming through. We're actually getting the cumulative values too. Those are all fine. If we wanted to go through, we could either kind of grab those cumulative values and just return the averages, or I can return the full list of values. If I wanted to sort of compute the average in here, I would just do that inside the node. So again, I'll just do that. Oh, a little bit of uh, list flattening. Then, what would you prefer, total or average? Any preference? Okay, average it is. So we'll say math at average. Okay, now, this is something we'll make an output. So. This I'll just call the average insulation. Okay, so I got inputs, I got outputs. Let me go ahead and save this away. Again, I always like to save them in the same folder just because I think it's a lot easier to kind of find them later when I need to use this. So I'm gonna put it over there, put it in session 12. I'll put it back in 12.1. Surface test rotation parameter, that looks pretty good. Okay, so I've done a little editing, I sort of created my custom node by grabbing everything. I did a little kind of grooming around the edges. I went through and kind of put, fixed, uh, gave myself a new output, I gave myself a new input. The net effect of all that is if I come on back here, you'll see I actually have new inputs and the new output there. So we're actually in pretty good shape. So the question then becomes, how do you go through and actually do a list map? Okay, and it's actually, once you've done this amazingly simple, here's what you gotta do. You gotta come up with a list of input values. You have to give it a function that has one opening. Okay, and then you choose which of the different data results you want. And for every input value, it'll give you that output kind of on the back side. So let's go ahead and test this. What I'm going to do is create just a little range of values. And just to be on the safe side, before I go 0 to 360, I'm going to go a little 0 to 30, just to sort of see, because it's going to take a lot of time to do all the way around as a circle. So I'm just going to come up with some different values that are inputs. So for my project rotation, I could do this a couple different ways. I could go ahead and say go 0 to 30, do it in increments of 10, okay? And that'll give me, let's see what it did. 0, 10, 20, 30, okay? If I wanna plug that in as the project rotation, okay? If I just plug those values in, here's the deal. It wouldn't know what to do because there's three different or four different rotations in it, so it's a little confused about what to do. What you gotta do is tell it, hey, I want you to feed in those values one at a time. So what we do is we create this list map, and this is the list, and this is what we map it to. And here's what it looks like. After all this buildup, it's kind of like anticlimactic. But here's what it looks like. We say list map. I give it a list of values. 
I give it a function that I want to use. And for the function, you basically tie into what is the value that you want to pull out. And if what I want to pull out is the average insulation, okay, what you're telling it to do is, okay, run this function for each of those. Run it at zero, run it at 30, or 20, 10, 20, and 30, and give me a list of different values over here. do a little bit of work because it has to do it on like all four of the cases. You might guess that every time it's flashing there, it's going through an iteration. And I think back in there, so we can't see it back in there. This is a little transparent to us because I don't have any panels. It's just a lot of geometry being mapped out. But let's let it run and see what we come up with. As it's running, let me kind of catch up with you guys in terms of, has anyone been following along trying to create this yet? Or just watching so far? I actually have the degrees in Jarplate. Yeah. Oh, OK. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens in terms of the whole degrees. There's that whole question in the original function. Remember, they had radians to degrees. This set looks like it wants radians. We'll see what happens in here. OK. Let's see what's happening in here. That looks like it worked. It actually looks like it gave me a little bit of difference in there. Oh, you do know? Yeah. Okay. Now there's all sorts of reasons it might be happening, but let's just stop and kind of consider what's happening here. I got these different input values. I have the average insulation for each of these different rotations coming out there. It's giving me something. Again, I should probably go through and check it one at a time just to kind of verify at first that it really is doing what I want it to do. Oh, it is just really whatever input, it basically takes your function and whatever the hole is, oh. in this case, it just plugs the hole. Here. Here. So we'll go through and do some debugging. How about if we do this? Let us go ahead, let's take our break now. And if you can, come on back in five. And as we're breaking, I'll go ahead and kind of solve some individual problems and we'll uh, try and do some debugging about why it did or didn't work on different people's machines. But this is really the gist of it. It's pretty much create a function, go through and leave an opening, and plug in values to get some values back. Okay, and we'll go ahead and look at some variations on that. Okay, so let's go ahead and break now, and I'll do a little debugging, and then we'll come on back. <laughs>